Um, oh, I think hi. I, think um, I am Ashley. I am a speech and language therapist. I've been working with adults for about three years um, in both community and acute settings. That's me. Hi, I'm Elizabeth. I'm a paediatric speech and language therapist. I work in community settings across schools and nurseries and sometimes clients' homes. Hi, I'm Rachel. I'm from the Royal College of Speech and Language Therapists. Hello, my name's Sean. I'm a senior lecturer and uh, I'm a specialist speech and language therapist working with uh, transgender people to change their voice and communication. Hi everyone, I'm Saha. I'm a paediatric speech and language therapist and um, community based, so very similar to Elizabeth. Hi, sorry, I'm having a little bit of a technical issue. Um, I'm Artie, I'm a speech and language therapist at Southampton General Hospital. I work with adult inpatients um, pretty much everywhere in the hospital. Thank you all for joining us. I know we're not. <laughs> We're due to start at 20 past, aren't we? Should we, should we wait a couple of minutes to see if anyone else is going to join? And then we've got Robin. I, uh, oh, hi. I, I, I was having huge technical issues. I'm glad I've made it in. <laughs> oh, good. Do you want to introduce yourself? We've just gone round. Yeah, I just caught the last of that. Uh, my name is Robin. I'm the speech and language therapist. I work um, with adults in an acute hospital and in stroke early supportive discharge in Surrey. Wonderful. Welcome to you all. I'm so glad that all, all of these great speech language therapists and students have been able to get uh, get together um, and to tell you a bit more about the profession. Uh, I'll hand over to Robin, who's going to talk through uh, a couple of quick slides, and then everyone will have a chance to tell a bit more about their experiences. Sorry to interrupt you. Uh, I, I'm the uh, hub. I'm your hub helper um, for, for the session. Uh, my name's David, and uh, I'm a medical student at the University of Nottingham. Um, so uh, I'll just disappear. Um, you, you, you've. You look like you all know what you're doing. So if you need any help, we we have any, <laughs> if you need any help or you have any technical difficulties, I'll pop up and help you. But you just go ahead whenever you like. Thank you, David. Thank you, David. Oh, oh, over to you, Robin. Um, so, um, I can't, oh, here we go. Just let me know when you want to go along to the next slide. Yeah, okay, great. Um, so this is um, some myths about speech and language therapy. So a lot of people believe that we teach elocution. We do not teach elocution. Um, we're not acting coaches. We're not teachers, but sometimes we work very close with them in the school setting. And we're not nurses, but again, in the hospital setting, we work very closely with them. Next slide. So what do we actually do? So there's a huge range of different career options within speech and language therapy. And we work with people right through the lifespan from children who are in school, maybe having speech and language difficulties, children with autism and learning disabilities, people who stammer, right through to adults who have communication and swallowing difficulties of a, a neurological condition like a stroke or Parkinson's disease um, or as a result of head and neck cancer. And we also work in the criminal justice system um, with people who have communication difficulties there as well. Next slide. So there's lots of reasons why you might want to be a speech and language therapist. It's a degree profession um, and it's a three or four year undergrad degree or a two year master's degree if you already have a undergraduate degree. There's great career prospects, a huge range of areas to work in and different career routes depending on your interests. So you could work with adults or children or pursue a career in academia um, in teaching or research in speech and language therapy. Um, there's a huge variety in the workplaces. We work in hospitals, schools, community clinics, prisons, charities. Um, there's a 
big chance to work with other professionals. Um, you can make a difference to people's everyday lives, which is the thing that I love most about this career. Um, being an autonomous professional and using language, science and creative skills, it's a great mix for those kind of skills. Um, and those are all reasons why you might want to become a speech and language therapist. That's wonderful. Thank you so much um, for that introduction, Robin. I think I'll hand over now um, to you and Artie and Ashley to talk a bit more about um, what what the profession means to you and the difference that you've made to patients. Thank you. Do you want me to start? <laughs> so okay, I... I've, as I say, I've been qualified for about three years now and I was trying to rack my brains to talk about somebody and a situation where I've made a difference to somebody's life and there are so many um, that I could choose. But probably one of the, the most career-defining moments for me, if you like, was a chap who was um, in hospital. He'd had quite a significant stroke. Um, he was very poorly, he had communication difficulties, and he also had a very unsafe swallow. Um, so basically, whenever anything he tried to eat and drink was all going on to his chest, it was giving him really nasty chest infections, and he was just getting more and more poorly rather than, than getting better. Um, in the hospital, he had um, an x-ray of his swallow, um, and that basically showed how unsafe his swallow was. Everything that he was eating and drinking was going on to his lungs. Um, so um, there were sort of a, a, a lot of meetings, um, and we had to talk about his long-term nutrition options. Um, so for this chap, unfortunately, because his swallowing was so unsafe, um, he had to have a um, peg tube fitted. I'm not going to give you the long name because I can't say it. Um, but he had a peg tube. So basically he was um, being fed directly into his stomach. He was discharged after about three or four weeks into a care home. Um, and because I'm on a rotational post, I then rotated out into the community. Um, and then I was able to pick him back up again. Um, and when I met him, um, he was really, really depressed. He was bed bound. He wasn't engaging with any therapists at all. Speech therapy, occupational therapy, physiotherapy. Um, he went in and out of hospital a few times because he was so desperate to eat. Um, but every time he tried, um, it all went onto his chest and he just got very poorly straight away. So I went a few times and he didn't engage with me at all. And then um, at some point I went, I'm just going to go back and see him one more time. I expected at the end of that day I would discharge him. Um, but for some reason that day I decided I wasn't going to discharge him. I was going to give it another shot. So we had a long conversation about what his options were. Um, and he decided that he would like to do some swallow therapy based on the x-ray that he'd had um, a couple of months ago. Um, so we spent a lot of time doing therapy and um, a couple of times I went and he wasn't really doing it. And I said, look, if you don't do it, we're not going to get anywhere. Um, so then he said, all right, I'm going to I'm going to keep trying. Um, and after a few more visits, we had a discussion about whether we'd ha we'd have another x-ray or whether he just wanted to try and eat something. He didn't want to wait. He was desperate to eat and drink. So um, we gave it a go. We started off with very small amounts of, of food and drink um, and just some puree and some thickened fluids. And eventually over time, um, he got much better. He started to engage. The care home staff were like, he's a completely different man now that he can have something to eat. And um, eventually he put all the work in, he did all of the effort and he was eating and drinking um, a normal diet and normal fluids or regular diet and thin fluids nowadays. And um, for me, that was just the best thing and all of the care home staff said um 
he's completely changed he's really engaging with everybody he's interacting with all the residents and so that very small change just for me saying I'm willing to work with you I'm willing to try and let's give having something to eat and drink a, a go completely changed who he was um and yeah and that was it was mostly down to him he put in the effort he did all the therapy um and he tried but obviously I facilitated that and for me that was um one of the best moments um unfortunately he has now passed away um he got the virus that's around um and he has passed away but when we phoned the care home um to see how he was doing the care home manager said he's been having a whale of time he does not stop eating from when he gets up in the morning to when he goes into bed um he'd put on about three stones of weight not sure it's the healthiest thing um but obviously because he wasn't able to move he wasn't mobile eating and drinking was the only thing he had really um and she said even if he doesn't make it out he's just had the best six months of his life eating whatever he wanted so so yeah so that's my um little contribution to the world um one of many but um one that i'm very proud of thank you that's wonderful who wants to pick up from there hey i can um so my name's Valerie. i'm a speech and language therapist at southampton general um, it's a major trauma centre and the largest one in the south coast. So I work with patients pretty much all over the hospital. That could be in critical care. So I could be in ICU. Um, I could be in high dependency units. Um, patients who are intubated and ventilated or have tracheostomies. I could be working on respiratory and cardiac wards in cancer care. I could be working in medicine for older people and um, potentially people with dementia. Um, and one of my favourite places to go is neurology, um, where we work with patients and people who have had any kind of brain injury, things like car and motorcycling accidents, um, surprising number of people who have fallen off a ladder or had a ladder fall on them. Um, lots of people who have had things like um, tumours or um, any kind of spontaneous bleeds in their brain. And then, of course, progressive conditions like Parkinson's or motor neuron disease um, or MS. Um, so what I do um, is I work with uh, communication and um, for me, no two days are really the same. And what I do massively depends on the person that I'm seeing and what they want to achieve. Um, so, for example, um, I've worked with a person who was on ITU um, following a skiing accident in France. And all they wanted to do was to be able to tell their family members that they loved them and that they were well. Um, so I was able to use um, that create a communication device for them and help him use that with his family members. Um, I've worked with people who have had dementia, who um, family members are struggling to talk to them um, or family members feel like that person doesn't remember their name. Um, I like working with other people as well. So I work with lots of physiotherapists, occupational therapists, dietitians. Um, we all come together really in a hospital environment um, to do the best thing for someone. And that can even be as simple as um, I had a young patient tell me that all she wanted to do was put a boomerang up on Instagram and um, she wasn't able to communicate that or even understand that process. And that's where I could be in there and work with a physiotherapist because that was her goal. Um, so what I do really is about advocating for a patient and providing them with a choice and giving them the means to make their choice. A lot of what I do comes down to helping them um, understand the decisions that they need to make when they're in hospital and um, providing it in a clear way, helping them to communicate that over. Um, and if they can't do anything, you know, if they can't communicate or understand, how can they then go on into into, you know, having the rest of their life? Um, so I'll just quickly end with something that I was trying to explain to a friend. Um, I think COVID has been really this time because um, it's shown us that the most important things are communicating with loved ones and eating and drinking. Um, people turn to Zoom, virtual kind of platforms like this. They use Snapchat, Instagram, TikTok, everything. If you can't communicate, you're not able to access all of those ways in an already isolating situation. And that's where people like us come in. Um, you might be living and you might be alive due to medical management, but we're adding quality of life. And that's something that I'm really passionate about. So thank you. Inspiring. Thank you. Um, Robin, do you want to come in with your story? 
you. Um, so, um, not many people, as speech and language therapists, we work with, with swallowing disorders as well as communication disorders, and that's already been um, touched on by um, everybody else. Um, and I work with adult patients in the hospital and in their own homes, and it's a really varied role, and each day is different. Um, so what I love most about being a speech and language therapist is the feeling that you're making a difference to someone's life. Helping. And being able to enjoy communicate, and being able to enjoy eating and drinking. Um, so that I'm going to talk about where I felt like I made a big difference is year old man and he had collapsed and he was admitted to hospital with a heart condition so he needed emergency surgery to insert a pacemaker and after the surgery he had severe swallowing problems and that's because the nerves that control the muscles for swallowing were damaged um, during the surgery he had an x-ray of his swallowing at the hospital which showed that food and drink was going down into his airway safe to eat and drink anything all so he was given a peg that Ashley has already mentioned. It's a medical device that allows food and drink to be delivered directly into your stomach um, to avoid having to swallow anything. And this patient to eat and drink, rely on being fed by a tube for the rest of his life. And um, so he was referred to speech and therapy in the community for um, a swallowing assessment. Um, and so I picked him up and referred him back to the hospital to have another x-ray of his swallowing. It showed that he still had really severe swallowing problems, but he really wanted to give it a go. So he was advised to tr start trialing an exercise. It looks like we've, we've lost... Uh... Robin, I think, but I think next Elizabeth and Sahar are going to tell us about how they came to the profession and what made them want to be a, a speech and language therapist. Uh, Elizabeth, do you want to start? Hi, yes. So I came into the profession quite late and I felt it was important to let people know that actually you can start your career progression at any time. I came from a nursing background and I worked in mental health and I because of the difficulties that patients that I worked with had with eating and drinking led me into wanting to work in speech and language therapy. And I always expected to work with adults, but it so worked out that on my career path after qualifying, um, I was able to work with children. And because I'm a mature student, I had to go down the access to health route and um, went to university for three years. I had a family already. I already had an established um, career and decided that actually it's time to, to change. And I do want to encourage people that are listening or watching that you can do that at any point at all in your career pathway. And speech and language therapy is such a varied profession that you can go into such different roles. As my colleagues have already um, spoken about, there's so many different aspects of there's the communication and there's eating and drinking. And we're working with patients from birth until the grave we do such a range of work. My daily um, routine is so different. I actually am a paediatric speech and language therapist and I work in the community. So I often um, go into schools or nurseries, um, helping children who have language difficulties or children that have speech difficulties. Some children have eating and drinking um, difficulties. We have um, children with complex needs and you know, I don't think people actually realise the work that we do with speech language therapists because if you have a child and then it's difficult for them to communicate with you. How do we communicate with those children? What do we do? And that's how varied our work really is. And so um, it's just that uh, there's so many things to do. There's so many options to go down. You know, you can go into the academic world and do lecturing you can go into management there is so much things you can actually specialize in either um, language disorder or speech sounds there are so many different things and even though I've started late and I've only recently qualified the support that you get for supervision and career opportunities um, it's an amazing profession to be in 
and I just want to encourage people to just um, research about speech and language therapy and the different avenues that you can take and the variety of, of um, opportunities that are open to you. It's so varied, you will never have one day that's exactly the same. Um, and I, I'll, I'll leave that the rest to you, Sahar, because you're also a paediatric yeah. speech and language therapist. I don't want to speak about everything, but thank you. <laughs> Fantastic. Yeah, thank you, Elizabeth. I think some of our, we've kind of had quite a similar journey. So, um, yeah, I'm a paediatric speech and language therapist, community based. I was also kind of a mature student. So I studied my undergrad in psychology after my A-levels and then was teaching in a hospital for a little bit. Um, and I actually didn't really know what speech and language therapy was as a career. I kind of just stumbled into it when I was teaching um, and I loved it. And I loved how much impact the speech therapist had on the child, the family um, their whole kind of everyday life as well. So for me, that was a huge part of me choosing the career. Um, and also that it's kind of a combination of the medical side, linguistics, um, phonetics and that was all of my kind of key interests too um, so yeah I've I did the MED site at Sheffield so that was a two-year postgrad course um, and yeah just very a smaller cohort very supportive um, it's an intense course nonetheless but very much worth it in the end um, there was you know definitely lots of opportunities for placements um, and I think once you qualify, there's always learning opportunities, there's um, networking opportunities and super, supervision um, and, you know, to enter kind of research routes, that kind of thing too. Um, so, yeah, sort of my work now is really general. So I work in mainstream special schools um, a bit in clinic as well so with early years preschool settings um, and yeah the best kind of thing for me is that the, there's always a challenge and um, I'm never bored in my job either um, there's it's such a fulfilling role to be such a huge part of a child's life to help them communicate not only verbally but kind of non-verbally by any other means like Makaton, AAC um, and yeah, a lot of what I do now is working with uh, delivering training for teachers or parents. And I think like Artie said, it's a lot of multidisciplinary working. So you're working with OT, physios, um, teachers, health visitors, and, and yeah, that's kind of what I do. Thank you. Fantastic. Thank you so much for sharing your story. Um, I think Artie's going to tell us a bit more about what it's actually like to be a student speech and language therapist. What, what's the course like? Um, so I qualified in January 2019. Um, I studied down in um, Marjon, University of St. Mark and St. John's um, in Plymouth. And then I'm now a newly qualified practitioner. Um, so my A-levels were very much English and language based. And I was very interested in language acquisition and sociolinguistics, that kind of um, human interaction. And I was actually toying between speech and language therapy versus um, linguistics and some other kind of subject. Um, I started on a linguistics degree, but then in my final year, my um, granddad had a stroke and that left him with swallowing and communication and cognition um, impairments. And so during that time on the stroke ward, I actually got to see him undergo the assessments with speech and language therapists and with other different types of healthcare workers. And that is what really sparked that passion um, because I didn't consider working with, um, or I didn't associate speech and language therapy with hospital, with adults, with um, swallowing, eating, drinking, um, lots of different things. Um, so when I finally got to doing speech and language therapy, I did it as an undergrad. Um, and I would definitely agree with what Sahar said. It's definitely an intense course, um, you know, you are doing placement as well as um, you're having lectures, as well as managing things like um, essays and um, lots of active learning, reading, um, trying to go on lots of different courses and as well as having a good social life. It is hard for sure. But um, I think if you go through a healthcare career degree, um, you kind of all unite at the end of it in your setting that you're in. You just all have been through that same experience together of balancing all these different things. And it really comes in handy for kind of any other challenges in the future. 
Um, so in your first year, you would do a lot of your um, foundation level kind of modules and it might seem really disconnected from the rest of your profession and what you're going to be going on to do. But you study things like anatomy and physiology, you study um, sounds, you study um, so phonetics, you study um, the kind of principles of what underlies language and human communication, psychology, um, sociology. You have a really good grounding in all the foundation stuff about humans, really. And then after that, you then study specific conditions, specific communication disorders, specific swallowing conditions, future planning. You learn about the healthcare system. Um, a lot of it in lectures is what is then you what is then something that you can apply in a practical setting on your placements. So in my first year, I had observation placements. In my second year, um, I had some supervised work. So I would be carrying out activities, but very much under the supervision of someone. And by my final year, my fourth year, I was independently doing this um, and then coming back and feeding back. Um, it's going to sound really cheesy, but you never lose the skill of learning. So as a newly qualified practitioner, I'm now, um, well, coming up to a year. And I think within the first six months of my job, I actually learned more than I learned on my degree. And you do learn a lot on your degree. Um, it's just that you, you really, really learn so much by being there, by doing it yourself. And we're constantly learning. We're constantly updating. There's um, so many different avenues to go into. Um, right now, even during um, coronavirus times, there are so many um, CPD, so professional development sessions and webinars. Um, it's really exciting. It's actually a really exciting time for healthcare. Um, lots of us are learning how to use technology in healthcare in a different way. Um, so I'd say if you enjoy learning, but you also enjoy something where you can practically apply it and make a difference, then this course will really, really give you something. And just as a little caveat, I did it as a mature student and I did it as someone who didn't have any kind of science background and came with um, sort of uh, my own issues. But actually this degree, you can do it. Um, there were lots of mature students with families and children who were able to juggle things and there will be a way. All your lecturers are really supportive. They're all able to kind of guide you through that process. And think about what your actual real world experience brings you. For example, if you have gone through anything like mental health difficulties or any you know, opportunities that haven't quite worked out, they will actually add and make you a better therapist. And so don't let anything like that hold you back from applying for this. You can definitely do it. Thank you so much. That's really, really motivating. And speaking of amazing lecturers, um, handing over now to to Sean, who's going to talk a little bit more about about the course and about how to apply and and how to get experience. Thank you, Rachel. So, hello, everyone. I um, I currently deal with admissions, one of the universities that um, offer speech and language therapy, um, and um, all of the programs um, kind of would uh, uh, recommend similar things to the things that I'm recommending this afternoon. Um, we understand that at the moment, the current coronavirus situation means that some of the activities that we normally recommend might not be possible. Um, but I'll kind of go through some of those items as we go through this short presentation. So one of the things that all the universities agree on, you don't need to actually observe speech and language therapy to apply to the degree programme. Um, and this is mainly because speech and language therapists are busy doing their job and providing the clinical placements that you will actually access when you're on the degree programme. So as people have talked about, you quickly, um, in the programme that I uh, helped to run, even in the first year when you've only you haven't even finished your first year foundation training we send you on clinical placements so that you can start to find out about placements and lots of my students say well i don't know about stroke or working with children and um, that's the whole point trying to find out what you don't know um, and being ready to learn about that and apply it so it's really practical and we really value people's skills right from the start so because of that, 
uh, most services won't offer you the opportunity to observe speech and language therapy because they're so busy. And really, we want people who have the right foundation skills to access the programme. We don't really want someone who already knows about the programme because we want you to gain your own perspective on that. So in your personal statement when you're applying, we would um, recommend that you kind of talk about your understanding of the role of speech and language therapists. So maybe citing one or two examples that you've pursued, that you've um, uh, researched, and what kind of skills you have as a person that make you suitable for the career. So as people have said, if you've gone through a particular difficulty, if you've maybe helped someone else um, with a difficulty, um, maybe you're a really good communicator, um, maybe you've done voluntary work in the past and you've worked with teenagers that have had real problems um, and you've kind of used your communication, listening and understanding skills to really understand that young person and help them to realise their potential. Maybe you've worked with some older people, um, maybe in a care home or uh, maybe uh, helping people who are, are isolated and need some conversation. So it doesn't have to be um, actually doing any therapy. It's using the skills that you will use and getting to know maybe one of the populations that you will work with during uh, the degree programme and in your career with us. And because you're working for the NHS, we, we want to, you to show that you're caring and compassionate. And that might seem obvious, um, but it's, it's kind of really useful to say what motivates you to become a speech therapist. You know, we, you need a lot of patience, you need a lot of listening and empathy, maybe working with people who you don't share a language with, um, that you really want to help. So. Um, don't be afraid to talk about the kind of experiences that you've been through or your family's been through or in your voluntary work that you are really interested and motivated by. Because we know there are lots of different areas that speech therapists are involved in and you can't know about, about them all. So it's better to tell us a lot about the area that you found out about rather than trying to have a big scattergun approach. So how can you do that, particularly at the moment when there aren't a lot of voluntary uh, experiences available? Well, um, just looking at BBC iPlayer and things like that, you can watch some tremendous documentaries at the moment. Um, uh, my specialist area is bilingualism and working with trans clients. So um, you might uh, watch something on iPlayer like um, there's a, a story of a young man uh, and his journey to becoming a trans person. It's not really about his speech therapy, but it's all the other elements that might impact on uh, his journey that you can understand as a therapist. So um, it's really helpful to know about that. You might go and visit some websites on children's speech and language disorders, look at some of the advice leaflets. Um, you might want to read some of the books, but not technical books about speech therapy. What is it like to experience a stroke and to lose your communication? Um, that's something that people have never really considered because we speak so effortlessly and we communicate and it's really enjoyable. And as people have talked about in their case studies this, uh, this afternoon, you know, I enjoy, I'm having a meal this evening with one of my friends. It's one of the real joys after lockdown. Um, and I think that's, that's something we take for granted. So if that put your life at risk, what's that like? So read um, maybe some books around people's life experiences. Um, around those. So we're really lucky in that we've got the internet and we've got lots of really good books. Um, currently, the um, Black Lives Matter movements, what's it like to experience prejudice? Most of our members are white, monolingual people. It's really helpful if you've read those books and find out what it might be like to um, speak another language and, and somebody be really negative about that when you're trying to raise a child um, speaking your language. Um, and I see on chat someone's talking about things like The Diving Bell and the Butterfly, really good uh, books to pursue that are really enjoyable. So we don't want you to do lots of hard learning and get stressed out before this quite challenging course. We want you to learn about society and disability and different experiences so that you're equipped to work with our really fascinating uh, clients. So voluntary experience, you're looking at working with children and young people acquiring new skills, older people, 
or perhaps people who have um, speech language or communication needs. And I know that lots of organisations are starting to adapt to the coronavirus situation. So people like the Stroke Association, people like Aphasic, they're looking for people to do drop-in chats, things like that. So um, I think more of those opportunities will start to open up. And I know that lots of um, people that I'm um, interviewing over the last few months have started to do that kind of work. Um, and if you can't do these things, don't worry, do that reading, visit those websites, look at uh, documentaries, go on YouTube, people blog about their experiences. I know the trans community is very active there, but you'll also find people talking about their experience of stroke, of having children with speech, language and communication needs, maybe a parent of a Down syndrome child. So there's really lots of fantastic resources to learn about the perspective. Um, we've got some great websites. The Royal College of Speech and Language Therapists have excellent resources that have been um, in the chat today. And lots of charities also have really excellent resources telling you all about the conditions. So if there's a condition you're not really sure of, you can read up about that. Um, speech therapists work with such an enormous range of people. I mean, I listen to people's careers and think, I don't really know how I would do that. And I'm a speech and language therapist. So don't be worried if you, you kind of see that there's lots of different ways of working, but you might stumble across something that you find really fascinating that you can talk about at interview or on your personal statement. As I say, you don't need to understand everything. Get over your enthusiasm, your empathy, your excellent communication skills, and be reflective. That's what all the admissions officers say. We want people who really think about their own presentation and how that might differ to their clients and build that communication bridge with them. So really knowing what it might be like to have those difficulties. What quality make you somebody who could be sitting here in a few years time. We really want you people who've got that vision. So A-levels, don't forget the wide variety of things that are applicable, not just A-levels, look at the university admissions pages, but broadly we, we take in things like sciences like psychology, biology, arts and languages. You need to be compassionate. You need to have excellent communication skills, be really reflective as I've touched on, um, show that you're caring, really blow your trumpet around that and some awareness of maybe one or two roles of what speech and language therapists do. So that's a real whistle-stop tour um, of the kinds of things you can do to uh, access speech and language therapy. Thank you, that's fantastic. Such an interesting um, course to get on to. Uh, there's a few questions coming through on the chat. Um, I wonder if people would just want to uh, have a, a look and see which ones you'd like to answer. Um, so someone's asking about virtual work experience. Sean, I know you touched on that a bit, but is there any more that you'd like to say? I think the thing really is, again, to emphasize that we don't expect you to have done or observed speech and language therapy because it's so um, difficult to get those opportunities. So really, if you can do anything like befriending services, and I know the NHS has asked people to do things like, even the experiences that people have had over the COVID period of maybe phoning a lonely person, um, delivering shopping, working for the community. Um, I know people who have gained experiences um, volunteering to do all those kind of things. It doesn't need to be really um, kind of something amazing like doing a sky a, a, a skydive or something like that. It's the real everyday community stuff and showing that you're caring and compassionate that really matters. Thanks, Sean. Um, someone's asking about what speech and language therapists do in the criminal justice system. Can anyone talk more about that? I don't, I don't think anyone's currently working in criminal justice, but... It's a good question, but I used to work with children with severe language problems. ...difficulties in communicating. Oh. Go on, Liz, you, you answer. Yeah, so speech and language therapists can advocate for those that have difficulties in communicating. So it could be people that have got learning disabilities, for example, or it could be people that have difficulties understanding the legal terminologies. And um, so speech and language therapists can be advocates for that communication link in the um, um, justice system. They also work in medium secure units as well. So there's a lot of information on the Royal College website in regards to that. I haven't personally worked in that, but I just touched on that just to, to give you a little bit of an insight 
to what we can actually do. Thank you. That's fantastic. Really helpful. Would anyone like to add anything else on that? Just to add to that, Rachel, I know that um, people often say to me, well, you know, children will grow out of their difficulties. We know that children that don't access treatment, particularly for severe language disorders, can be at high risk of educational failure. And then because they might not understand the consequences and the sequence of events, they may be more susceptible to um, being drawn into criminal activity through gangs because they, they find acceptance in those environments. And I've heard talks by uh, prison officers saying that speech and language therapists are some of their most valuable staff because Everyone's heard of dyslexia and lots of prisoners can't read, but actually people haven't heard of developmental language disorder. And many prisoners, um, particularly young men, because males are much more um, uh, susceptible to developmental language disorder, can have that undiagnosed because they've not accessed service and gone have to have criminality. So we have been really key in rehabilitation in those settings. Um, just to add to that quickly as well, um... I have a colleague who worked with um, quite a few people who have had brain injuries um, following things like car accidents or, you know, some of the other stuff I spoke about. And that can actually affect your ability exactly as um, Sean was saying, affect your ability of reasoning and understanding the consequences, or it can affect your ability to actually stop yourself from doing something, to stop yourself from being impulsive. Um, and sometimes that can lead to crime or being vulnerable to organisations of crime. And so she works with lots of people like that, um, actually within prisons, um, and also supports them on trial to make sure that they can actually understand um, what charges are being levied against them, if the trial process itself is fair for them as well. Thank you so much. Um, someone's asking about the qualifications that are needed, and I know, Sean, you talked us through that, um, and a number of the SLTs on here have mentioned you know, how they started off and you know, how they how they got to the career. Is there anything else that anyone would like to add about um, what's particularly valuable or or what you would what you would recommend to someone thinking about a career in speech and language therapy? In terms of the, the qualifications and the subjects that they might want to study. I mean, I um. <laughs> uh, do, do you want to, to say about the fact that it's it's just I, I think if you talk to any speech therapist I don't know about you we have very different ex routes into the career that's key, kind of the commonality isn't it yeah exactly yeah, I was just about to say that I think everyone on the course they they were like ranging from lawyers and accountants and then you know there was quite a few of us that did psychology so yeah I wouldn't say there's a specific route that you feel like you need to go into or like a, a a degree that you need to do um yeah I think it's more so like Sean was saying how you are presenting your kind of interests your passion and the skills that you kind of need to be um a speech and language therapist that's fantastic um one of the things that I did when I was applying um was I wrote to all of the universities I was interested in going to I sent um an email to all of their admissions team just to say this is my background these are the qualifications I already have um, based on this is there anything else that I need to do for your course so I think some universities have a few quite specific things they want you to have um, whereas others are a bit less specific so if you are thinking about going somewhere don't be afraid to get in contact with the tutors there and and sort of say this this is what I've done this is what I um, this is what qualifications I already have and ask for that advice um, because that, I found that really helpful um, when I was on my journey. Thank you so much. That's great. Um, I can see lots of lots of discussion in the chat thread as well. Lots of recommendations about um, books that people might want to read or films they might want to see. So thanks everyone for chipping in there. Um, I think we have a few minutes left if anyone has any uh, further questions. So. I think we can stay on um, and be available to answer any more. Um, is there anything else that any any of our presenters would like to add? Someone's asking about learning science systems. We oh, oh, great. 
we um, we wouldn't recommend that you need to learn any particular sign systems because each local authority or even school can have a different signing system. There are some very well-known ones like Makaton, but for example, in my language re resource, we use Paget Gorman sign speech because we needed the grammatical symbol signing. And um, it's not essential for the course. It's great to be aware of signing and how important that might be but different services when you're on placement might recommend a particular signing system. I don't know if anyone else has had experience of different signing systems across that, that, that they might have used. Um, no, I think you have to do quite a lot. Sorry. It's all right. Mm -hmm. Actually, you okay. guys <laughs> done. Ashley, do you want to say first? Oh, I was just going to say that um, the university that I went to um, at the time I was there, I don't know if they still do it, they offered Makaton as sort of an add-on um, onto the course if you wanted it. Yeah. Um, and there was also at my university a British Sign Language Society, um, which I joined while I was there and um, I did do BSL Level 1. But if I'm perfectly honest, I've not ever needed to use it, so I've completely forgotten it. Yeah. If I'm allowed to say so that. Do you want to say <laughs> you, you were going to say? Yeah, so I was just going to say um, we didn't learn kind of signing on the course. Um, but when I, so in my NHS trust that I work in now, we kind of had the Makaton training, BSL. Um, and yeah, we used Makaton quite a lot in my general work. I must say that, that BSL is a language in its own right, like French or German, and, and I would work with interpreters with someone if they spoke, say, Punjabi, and at my same attitude of someone who spoke spoke BSL. So mm -hmm. in, in our view, just because someone is deaf and uses BSL just means they're an other language user and they don't really need my help. So, mm. Someone's asking about cued articulation. Yes. <laughs> you use cued articulation. Yes, we would use that in therapy. Um, that's a technique rather than a particular sounding system to make sounds clearer. Some therapists use it, some don't. I, I really like to use multisensory approaches. Fantastic. And someone is asking about uh, part-time courses. Are there, are there courses available and is there funding available for those? Does anyone have experience with that? I think there's the main important thing is that there are three and four year undergraduate degree courses. There are two year postgraduate degree courses. Individual universities may offer so additional routes, but you will find those advertised. So if you explore, I've already put the link to all the different universities that offer a, a speech and language therapy course. It, it's a bit like I'm the admissions officer for one of the universities. I would get a very specific request. And as people have said, we would be able to advise on a case by case basis. Um, and I think we would want to know that you would uh, be applying for a part time route. The university I go to cur uh, currently doesn't offer that route, but I know some do. That's great. Um, Thank you. To add to that, um, there are, this is one of those degrees where even though at the beginning you might not need that flexibility, if something comes along, say so there was um, a lady in our year who became pregnant. Um, she was able to kind of keep studying and defer her exams and things like that in according to that process. Um, so you'll generally find that um, speech and language therapists are quite flexible, I, I like to think, and the lecturers are the same. So once you're on that course as well, if your circumstances change, they do generally try and accommodate that. And just to say the funding, there is um, £5,000 um, from the government which is new this year for new and existing students so that's that's a, a really big help for people applying for this degree that's great thank you um i can see someone's also asking about uh, apprenticeship schemes um i'm aware that those are in development but that they've been paused because of the pandemic because universities have had to focus on getting their courses um, up and running I do think that the University of Essex are going to be launching a scheme in 2021. Um, so hopefully others will be following suit as well. Sean, I don't know if you have anything else um, on yeah, that. Yeah, some universities have 
decided to go first and to be trailblazers. So not every university will offer that route at the beginning. So places like Exeter and I think Manchester Met um, are trailblazers and they would be offering routes, I think, while we find out how those courses can work best. So in any one geographical area, I think if everybody piled in, there would be too much demand. So it's, it's finding out, you know, looking at those particular university courses and, and staying in touch again. If people know, the admissions know that you're interested in that route, we would keep you up to date. So it's well worth kind of making, uh, getting to know your admissions person because they're very helpful. Thanks very much. I think we're out of time now. Um, that's been a really interesting discussion and I'm so happy that you've all all joined and shared your experiences. So thank, thank you all very much for doing that. Um, I hope it's been useful for those listening as well.